Okay. Well, with that, we will go ahead and get started. Stuart Saint, thank you for joining us for a few minutes prior yeah. to your 10th start here at the RSM Classic. Obviously, a tournament that means a lot to you for a lot of reasons. Um, just a few comments on being back here this week and kind of assessing the state of your game as you're heading into the week here. Well, it's we're getting into winter time, so I think it's a little harder for us all to assess our games because it's just uh, naturally, you know, with the cold air and windy weather and wet turf, it's just it's a little harder to sort of assess how you're playing until the bell goes off and you start competing. But so that's always kind of a fun part of this time of year. Just there's a little bit of uncertainty, I think, with every player. But it's always nice to come back to St. Simons and Sea Island. It's uh, just one of the best places in the country and. Um, you know, it's, I live in Georgia. We're here in Georgia again this week. So um, this co coastline is really special. We've had a lot of players come in on how, how much Davis adds to the event as the tournament host. If, uh, uh, a lot of people move to the area. A lot of people don't miss the event. If you could just touch on how much Davis has been for uh, not just you guys, but the tournament as well. Well, Davis is kind of affectionately known by all of our friends as Uncle Davis, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. and he kind of treats everyone like that. You know, he's kind of a put his arm around you, you know, tell stories, kind of a like come alongside friend. And um, that's uh, that's the way he's always been ever since I've known him for years and years. And he kind of treats this tournament like that too. You know, it's a special place for him being a resident here for so long, and he's tied to this community. And um, you know, he he has his heart in this tournament, and you can tell that um, you know, he's a first class. Dude, and, and this tournament is first class. Okay, all right, well, I've just got one more question and then we'll take a few questions from our guys online. Um, obviously, you're off to a great start this season, having collected your seventh win at Safeway Open, and you follow that up with a fourth and a couple of others. Uh, um, just some what's connected, what's clicked, what's going right for you to start the season? Well, golf wise, um, you know, we're all so close out here. Even the 47 year olds can compete. It's just, if you just elevate a couple of little areas in your game and just get a little bit better, then you know you find yourself in contention or winning or finish really high and having some consistent runs. And if you just uh, if you go the other way, you find yourself on the outside of the cut or you know having a bunch of 50th place finishes. And it's just that close out here that if you can find a little tiny bit of extra performance, you can just pass a lot of people. And, and I was able to find a little bit of extra performance in my game before. Um, Safeway started as, as I sat out of the FedEx Cup playoffs in the last season. I was determined to try to get a little bit more, and, and I, I was able to find some, and it just translated immediately. It was uh, really uh, amazing. Okay, all right. Well, with that, we'll get a few questions in the queue for you. We will start with Adam Shupak. Adam, go right ahead. Hey, Stuart. So, 40 somethings, what, what has gotten in? Is it something in the water that uh, you, Sergio, uh, Brian Gay are all winning all of a sudden, and you would think maybe Tiger, but uh, you guys, what's going on? I, I don't know what's going on other than the fact that I think golf sort of lends itself to uh, success, you know, later in your life. I mean, it, it's just, uh, it's one of those special types of uh, sports that physically you can keep going. I think where you struggle more when you get in your mid to late 40s and, and beyond is not necessarily physically, because you can take care of yourself for a long time. I mean, look at Bernhard Langer. But mentally, I think, and also like kind of like almost chemically in your body, it, it gets a little harder to really like lock down that focus. And um, you let other things in your life kind of bother you. It's a little easier to have that give up mentality and you have to fight that stuff. And so it's, it's a different type of challenge than it was when I was 27, now that I'm 47. But just like any kind of challenge, there's a way to sort of attack it and understand it and try to move past it. And, and sometimes you just have to live and perform within it and, and do the best you can. Well, I think the biggest step for me, anytime I've faced challenges in my career, which has been, you know, plenty, I mean, I've not been um, exempt from any of the kind of challenges that any golfer faces. I think the biggest step for me has always been first understanding it. Um, I'm a why kind of person. I like to know why things happen, why I behave a certain way and sort of get to the root of, of why things are going on. And when I understand that, it makes it easier for me to see a path forward and to sort of, uh, you know, whether if I'm putting poorly or if I'm driving poorly, if I'm 
you know, getting more nervous than I used to or something like that, I got to understand why first and then we can go forward. And, and that's been a big key for me for my whole career. Okay. And then uh, one more if I could right now, just um, about your caddy situation. I know when we talked in, uh, in, in Sanderson Farms, you, you, your son was going to go back to Delta, but uh, I guess things have changed. <laughs> take, take me through uh, hmm. all that. Well, <laughs> we, uh, we finished high again in Bermuda had a good round on Sunday and we didn't have to leave till Monday. And so we were kind of sitting around the room with nothing to do. And Reagan was there and he caddied and my wife was there and we all sitting around. It's probably like the, um, sort of, you know, how nothing good happens with idle time and idle hands. <laughs> we all sat around and we're like, Hey, this has been really fun. You know, you're supposed to go back to work next week, but maybe, you know, this is the right time for you to push work back for a year. And, you know, I like you caddying and I think you're having a good time and you're good at it. And, it's nice to spend time with our son, and so um, we just got it worked out. He got it worked out with Delta Airlines that he was going to be able to uh, just sort of push his job back, and he'll go to work next year after he gets married in July, and he'll caddy the rest of the season. And um, so a change for us, but something I'm really looking forward to, and I think he is too. How much do you credit the way that you've been playing to having him on the back? I actually credit it a lot, and, and he's not just – of a, a guest caddy he's not just a family member out there carrying the bag he's he understands golf really well and he understands me and he's been a, a real asset to me uh, and maybe like a a little bit of an intangible kind of way but I just feel really calm out there with him you know I I know that when he's standing across with the bag and after we've made our decision I know that he has like full trust and 100 percent confidence that I'm going to be able to do what we just talked about doing and, and that's just a big asset to know that your caddy is just really behind you and believes in you and also has that sort of unconditional relationship with you that if it goes great, it goes great. If it doesn't, then, hey, we're still father and son. And so um, I think that has been a real big asset. And it's just helped me to, to be calm and to be confident and to really just kind of be myself. Thank you. Sure, Adam. Okay, we go now to Rex Hunger for X. When you look at the season you've had, and, and obviously the success that you've enjoyed this season, how do you balance that with kind of the rest of the year? How would you assess what has been a strange year for everyone? You mean the rest of the year going forward or looking back? Looking back. Yeah, well, I mean, it's definitely, when I think back to 2020, I'm going to have probably a little bit better feelings about it than most of the rest of the world's population because, uh, you know, 2020 hasn't been that kind to, to many of us. But, um, but there's definitely been some bright spots. Uh, both my kids got engaged this year. Uh, my wife and I both had COVID and, uh, in March, and my wife being stage four cancer uh, in treatment right now, you know, that was a big deal to us that she had it and went right through it. And so um, that's something we'll remember for sure, the nervousness of that. And then, you know, my win in Safeway and then having Reagan sort of transition into caddying for me and getting that uh, – I mean, we hope to have a, a, a really great experience between now and the end of this season. And that, that's just something that I think any parent would never want to miss out on. You know, it's such a unique opportunity. So 2020 will give us uh, some great memories and some relief, but also obviously like the rest of us, 2020 is, is, has stunk. A little bit different question to you, and I'm not trying to hate you at all. I'm not trying to hate you at all. But you see the success that Phil Hickson had on the PGA Tour Champions? Yeah, I, I haven't looked that direction at all because I just, I felt like, you know, you've got enough stacked against you when you're 47 or in your late 40s on the PGA Tour that if you, if you were to look ahead and start to focus on that and start to sort of dream big about like one day, you know, I'm going to be 50, I'm going to be out there, then um, you're just going to stab yourself in the back out here. Um, and just going to add one more thing to your list of challenges. And, and I just, I've not let myself do that. You know, I don't see myself being a Champions Tour player ever until, you know, I'm not exempt on the PGA Tour anymore. And I'm not saying that I won't. I'm saying I don't see myself that way. So I, I see myself competing on the PGA Tour and trying to win more out here. Thank you. All right, Stuart, we'll go now to Shane Ryan with Golf Digest. Shane? Uh, hi, Stuart. I've heard a couple of different perspectives. Some people think that uh, each tournament on tour has kind of its own atmosphere. Some are more relaxed, some are more intense. 
Uh, and then other people have told me that really everything's kind of the same because you're competing uh, day in and day out and you're you know, going from a house or a hotel to the course. Where do you fall on that? And um, if it is the case that everything's unique, can you tell me what you think is unique about the island and this week's tournament? I think everything feels a little bit different. And it's just like if you walked into a company, you would experience and feel that culture pretty quickly. You would start to understand what the culture is like in that company. Well, if you play, a, if you play at RSM and versus if you play at Waste Management Phoenix Open, you will understand there's two different cultures in those two events really quick, especially if you play the 16th hole at Waste Management. So um, every tournament has its own little culture, and, and here, it, it, this year, obviously, COVID has wrecked the culture of every tournament because we don't have fans for the most part. But uh, under normal circumstances, there's a lot of people here that you know, there's a lot of friendly faces, there's uh, volunteers that have been here year after year after year that are doing the same job, and you start to recognize and call out the volunteers by first name, you know, when they pick you up at the airport. So. It doesn't happen like that everywhere, but here feels like a real community and a neighborly small event. And that's, it fits because that's what St. Simons is. Waste management feels like a, a big, crazy festival, and that's kind of what Scottsdale is in the wintertime. You know, it's crowded and it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a completely different thing. So I, I feel like every tournament has its own culture and it's unique. And when you go place to place, yeah, there are certain things that stay the same, whether you stay in the same place or you commute to the course and you do your practice routines and all that stuff. Yeah, you, all that's the same, but all the terms have their own feel. Do you think this one uh, bears similarity to Hilton Head in any way? And I ask that because just by circumstance, it happens to be the postmaster's circle this year. Oh, well, that's a good point. I didn't realize that. I mean, I, I didn't think of that, but it, this tournament does bear some similarities to Hilton Head and the fact that um, at RBC Heritage, you're coming after the masters and you're during kind of like a spring break environment. So that tournament feels more like everybody's there on vacation and they're excited to see the golfers, but they're also going to the beach and it's part of a big vacation for people here. It feels more like the people that come out of the tournament are mostly, they live here. They, they spend a lot of time here. Maybe they have a second home here. They love the Island. They feel like they're, they're welcoming you here. And our RBC heritage, it feels like more like we're all being welcomed in there by uh, the tournament, but the, to me, the, the, the crowd, at uh, the fans at RBC Heritage feel like they're only there for the week, just like we are. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll go back to Adam and Shupak for a follow-up. Adam? Hey, Adam. Hey, Adam. Hey, Adam. Stuart, I think that's the first time I heard you talk about having COVID. Can you share a little color on what that was like, both you and your wife? And sure, and yeah, I haven't discussed it very much. Um, our friends and family know about it, but... Um, you know, with Lisa being at her, in her state of health, even though she's doing great and she's um, coming up on four years now of uh, in remission, which is, you know, fantastic. When COVID came about, we started to be very concerned about her because of the pre-existing conditions and um, other, um, you know, just difficulties health-wise that people are facing if they already have something with COVID. So um, we... Uh, we kind of we went through COVID in the very beginning before there was testing available before we really knew that much about it um we didn't know we had COVID until about two months later when we both got the antibodies test and we both had it and then we both got retested and it was confirmed like multiple times and then we could just point back to a time in march when we both fell ill um sequentially like over about seven days and so um lisa had i'd call it moderate to pretty serious um, not hospitalization or anything, but just pretty significant s symptoms, very flu-like. I had almost nothing. I had just about a half a day where I felt a little bit sore in my back and my shoulders, and that's it. But, um, you know, we didn't know much about it. It was the same week as, um, her, hers was the same week as when Players was canceled. Mine was the week after. And uh, like I said, we didn't really know. We just kept on I mean, there, I was actually on a flight coming back from Utah. I went skiing with my son. He asked me to come out with his college friends to go skiing, which I was like, I'm not missing that. And so, um, you know, when I came back from that flight, I flew round trip from Atlanta to Utah, and I came back, and I was sick. So I feel certain that I was probably spreading it on the flight. You know, this was before masks or anything. So looking back, you know, I 
would have loved to change that, but we didn't know much. And so uh, two months later, we, we found out we had it. In fact, it was right before my first tournament back after COVID um, at uh, RBC Heritage. Two weeks before that is when we got our antibodies tests and we found out we had it. Okay. And now that you've got this W and the exemption for, for a couple of years, uh, what is your what is your 2021 part of the calendar schedule going to look like? What, what are you most looking forward to getting back to that you, you maybe have missed the last couple of years? Well, Augusta, I did miss it in 19. I qualified for it in 19, but I played poorly. I was hurt that year, and I shouldn't have been playing, but I just tried to squeak out into Augusta, and, and you know, that was a mistake looking, looking back. But... Um, Obviously, you know, you look forward to Augusta, Kapalua, you look forward to playing at, at Kapalua, and um, that's a tournament you just love to be part of. But really for me, considering where I started this season in the 126-150 um, category, I wasn't guaranteed spots anywhere. So um, I would say the most thing I'm looking forward to is just the ability to sort of play where I want to play and put my schedule together. And I can schedule my stuff around when my kids' weddings are in July and September. So that's a, a real blessing to be able to do that too. There's a lot more than just, you know, play where you like to play the courses. There's, you know, we've got weddings, we've got all kinds of stuff going on, little parties here and there and showers that I want to be a part of. And now I can play when I can play and I can schedule those weeks off for when I can uh, be at those events. All right, and, and lastly, if, if your other son were to come out and caddy and join, join the ranks, <laughs> what, what young player would you suggest he try to get on the bag of? Uh, well, my, my other son, Connor, he's older than Reagan, so he's going to come out and caddy. We've already discussed this. And so um, I don't know where it's going to be yet, but he'll come out and caddy. And uh, I don't know that I'd want either of my kids to be on the bag of any other player because they're both too big of an asset. <laughs> so uh, I don't, I, there's enough disadvantage I have. I don't want to give anybody else more advantage. All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. We'll finish up going back to Shane. Brian, Shane. Hey Stuart, um, just using this opportunity to ask one that's a little bit off the beaten path, but um, you've played in five Ryder Cups, one of them was a win, uh, the other four were not, and I was just curious uh, to hear from you, what do you think was different about that one time, and I guess the broader question I'm asking is, what would you do if you were a captain, or what things did you see from the captains you saw that you think should be incorporated and that worked uh, during your playing career? Well, in, in my one in four Ryder Cup career, since you brought that up, <laughs> uh, no, nah, I'm kidding. Um, the one win where Zinger was the captain in 08, there was just an, an unbelievable level of organization before, and uh, there was no uncertainty about who you're going to play with and who you're going to spend your practice rounds with. It was all set, and there was a system that kind of paired up players together. There was just a lot of really in-depth uh, personality matching and studies, and um, I think that led to us being very comfortable on the golf course and you know we played like we were comfortable on the golf course and we won and the other Ryder Cups um, you know there was the, the captains all did a lot of work and did a good job but I think Zinger just took it to another level with organization and um, one thing I think that, that the brain the mind of the human being seeks is like certainty and calm and um, we don't like surprise that much and so um, Zinger did a great job sort of taking that surprise and uncertainty down to an almost non-existent level and it enabled us just to, to be comfortable with each other and, and um, you know, we, we performed really well. We, we really did and they, they did a great job. So um, I, I think if I was ever a captain or if I, was, if I got, was spoken to by a captain to ask me any advice, I would certainly just pinpoint that right away as an obvious, you know, um, that's an obvious something that I would definitely want to implement. Has the captaincy ever interested you? Yeah, it definitely. It definitely interests me. I think every player, it's very interesting to them. And um, I would love to be able to do that sometime. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people who are qualified for that. And uh, I, I haven't been a part of any teams in an assistant captain way. And there's a lot of younger players that are parts of that now every time. So it looks like maybe that the, uh, the, the ship's already left the harbor for me. But, um, you know. <laughs> I'd be willing to help in any way that I could. If they thought I could be a part of a winning team or a successful Ryder Cup or President's Cup team, I'd, I'd love to do it. Thank you. All right, Stuart, I think that about wraps it up for us. We appreciate your time and have okay. a great week. You got it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.